included. It's good to see all of you this morning. Keep in mind, if you would, our folks who are sick and hospitalized or otherwise incapacitated in some way. I talked to Brother Jim O'Brien Friday evening, or no, it was yesterday, I believe. I believe it was yesterday. And you probably are aware he had a spinal block uh, procedure on Friday, which is going to take its own sweet time to take effect, apparently. But he also mentioned the fact he, bless his heart, he's got to go and have something done every day this week, uh, culminating in the beginning of chemo on Friday. So it's going to be a a tough week in a lot of ways for the O'Briens, so do keep them. Jim O'Brien, keep them in your prayers. Something every day this week. Uh, everybody else, as far as I know, that was in our prayer list, seems to be improving, doing a little better, and so we're thankful for that. Uh, keep everybody in your prayers, if you would. Let's begin our time together with a word of prayer this morning. Father and God, you have blessed us with a gorgeous new day in the beginning of a new week, and for that we give you thanks. We know that you're the source and the origin of every good thing that we have in life, and we pray that when we experience those good things, we'll be grateful to you, and when we experience hard times, we'll recognize the opportunity to praise you for those good moments that we've had. We pray for our sick, asking that you relieve them and comfort them. We pray for those who are struggling with family issues or, or other problems, that you would bless them, grant them comfort and hope. We ask you to watch over us and bless us as we study from your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been talking about Jesus in prophecy. And the last three weeks, really, we've been talking more about, uh, I guess you'd say, conceptual aspects of that, Christian evidences or apologetics, more than specifically about prophecy. But this morning, let's get a little more to prophecies about Jesus. It's been observed that only one individual, specifically one man in all of history, has had the specific details, and we'll talk about some of the specifics of this as we go along, specific details of his birth, of his life and activities, of, of his death and even the manner of his death, and his resurrection, his, shall we say, refusal to remain dead. Only one individual in all of human history has had that much information about him forecast ahead of time, stated beforehand. There have been other individuals in history about whom claims and prophecies have been made. None of them had those claims and those prophecies laid out in detail in familiar, readily accessible, widely circulated, well-known public documents, the Old Testament, the way Jesus did. Think about it. How long were the books of the Old Testament in circulation, available to examination by human eyes before Jesus appeared? Now, how long were they available? How far in advance were these prophecies available and known to people? Minimum minimum 400 years because you've got a 400 year gap between Malachi and the coming of Jesus now you go back to Isaiah Isaiah the best known messianic prophet 
How long before Jesus did Isaiah live and prophesy? We know that Isaiah lived in the days of King Ahab, King Ben-Hadad and, uh, of Syria and others like them. Isaiah lived in the 8th century B.C., 700 plus years before the birth of Jesus. So for centuries, now you go back all the way to Moses, when did Moses live? Mo Moses lived roughly 14, 1500 years before Jesus. Moses recorded Ma uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I'm in the wrong covenant there for a second. Now, Moses recorded events that took place long before he did. But in terms of putting things in writing, 1,400 years before Jesus was born, Moses was recording in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of woman will crush the head of the See, uh, of the seed of Satan, the, of, of Satan. 15 centuries of knowledge. The life of Jesus appears in the first century and perfectly agrees in every detail with the prophetic forecast. Don't you know that every uh, prognosticator and false prophet of weather, meteorologist, wishes they could be that accurate? We talked about last week over 300, by some counts as many as 365 Old Testament prophecies of Jesus. And not one where somebody can point that out and say, no, he missed that one. Not one. All of these things matter. They matter because, I'm, I'm going to give you four reasons. These are not original with me. They matter because prophecy is one of the most profound evidences, fulfilled prophecy, one of the most profound evidences of the authenticity, the authority, the legitimacy of the scriptures. If you can forecast something before it happens, and then have it happen exactly as you forecast. What does that do for your credibility to those who, who hear the forecast when they see it realized? It, it, it inspires trust. When my girls were about three and five, we used to play, Lou Ann and I used to play a sort of game with them when we would travel as we would go back and forth between Oklahoma and Central Texas because we got to where we knew the route really, really well. And we knew which little towns had traffic lights that were synchronized. So if you hit the one on the north side of town green, you were gonna hit every light green all the way through town, unless somebody with a cattle trailer or something turned in front of you and threw you out of sync with the lights. But we would, roll into a little town and somewhere like uh, Vernon or way up in the north of Texas. And Emily particularly was aware of traffic, five, six years old, and she'd see that red light come, Daddy, Daddy, light's red. I said, and I, I'd just kind of wave my hand and say, turn green, light. Because I'm watching the, the cross lights and I can see their amber fixing to go red. I'm fixing to have a green light and we just roll right on through. So from about five or six years old until she was about eight and a half and became a skeptic, 
Emily believed that Daddy had the power of controlling traffic lights in his hands. I think Katie's still a skeptic. Fulfilled prophecy proves that the Bible is from God. Prophecies authenticate it as being exactly what it claims. Number two, if prophecy proves that the Bible is what it says it is, what does it prove about God? It proves that he is who he claims to be. Now think about this for just a minute. Who does the Bible say God is? Creator of all things. There you go, Sally. What else does the Bible say about the identity of God? God is, is light. In him there's no darkness at all. And when you, when you look at the concepts of light and darkness in the scripture, what do they represent? Light is, is, is truth and goodness and righteousness and wholesomeness and darkness is, is sin and evil and, and bad things. God is everything good. He's the creator. He's everything good. He's the provider of all that we need. He cares for us, sustains us, takes care of us. Fulfilled prophecies prove that God is who he claims to be, the true God. That's why the Apostle Paul could go into Athens in Acts chapter 17 and survey the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of idols and temples and images and, and things like that and say to those people who would have considered themselves his intellectual superiors, they weren't, you need to know about the God who made everything. Do you realize that when Paul began to speak in Acts 17, almost the first thing he said, if they were paying attention, told them everything you've believed about all these deities and images and demigods and semigods and so forth is wrong. Now, he didn't do it unkindly, and he didn't do it in a mean way, but almost the first thing he said, basically the second thing he said, was, you need to change how you think. And these were the people who thought they were the smartest people, not in the room, but in the world. Prophecies about Jesus matter because they prove God's omniscience, and his omnipotence. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go along. Omniscience means what? He knows everything. And omnipotence means what? He has power to do everything. Now, if he knows everything and he has all the power to do everything, then when he says, thus and such and so and so is going to take place, I'm going to send you a savior hundreds of years in the future and here's what he's going to do and be and look like and act like and speak and say and, and so forth. He has the power to make that happen exactly as he claimed. Well, hmm, 300 plus prophecies of a Messiah in the Old Testament, along comes Jesus. <clears throat> Which ones did he miss? Not a one of them. Prophecies about Jesus matter because they prove in a way that cannot be controverted, that cannot be denied. They prove that he is the long-awaited Messiah, the rescuer of fallen humanity. They prove that he is the Son of God, not in the sense of procreation, but in the sense of being God in human form, God in the flesh. They prove that he is everything the scriptures ever claim for him. Now these four points are the reasons 
that our history turns on the difference between B.C. and A.D. B.C. stands for what in the English dating system? Before Christ, basically. And A.D.? Anno Domini, Latin for in the year of our Lord or in the year of his rulership, the year of domination, literally. That's not fashionable nowadays. We don't want to acknowledge in academic and intellectual circles that Jesus is the focal point of history. So we've, we've adopted a new dating uh, format. Those, ter- those, those times that used to be described as B.C., now they're B.C.E., before the common era. And the, the time in which we live, well, that's C.E. You live in the year 2022 C.E., in the common era. Where's the change point between exactly? It's still Christ. Whether you acknowledge him or not, he's still the focal point of history. No getting around it. One other point to think about, and we've already sort of referenced this several times, the volume, the sheer volume of prophecies rules out the idea of any chance fulfillment, any random accidental fulfillment. Now, fulfilled prophecies discredit false gods and false prophets. It's not simply that fulfilled prophecies validate the Bible. If you validate the Bible, what do you do to every other claimed religious text? You invalidate it. That means that the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedas, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine and Covenants, the writings of Reverend Moon, and so forth. All of these other claimed religious authorities are invalidated by the Bible. Think about 1 Kings chapter 18. What did Elijah do that actually made Jezebel so angry in 1 Kings chapter 18? If you take your Bible and you look at 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 17 down to the end of the chapter, what you find is the contest on Mount Carmel. Now on a map of Israel, Mount Carmel is that that little thumb of land that juts out from the Mediterranean coast, juts out into the sea, and it's it's a it's a plateau, it's a table mountain that kind of juts out into the sea and then just <laughs> runs right down into the water. And that's where Elijah challenged King Ahab. King Ahab confronts him after three and a half years of drought. Is it you? You source of all the trouble in Israel? Is that really you coming to see me? And how does Elijah answer? It's not me that's the problem. You're the problem. Now get everybody together at Mount Carmel and let's settle this. And what does Elijah say to the people? How long will you go limping between two beliefs? If the Lord is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. Well, that's no different, really, than Joshua's challenge to Israel back in the the days of the conquest, is it? Choose you this day whom you'll serve. In Isaiah chapter 41, in verses 21 through 24, Isaiah challenges Israel's dedication to idolatry again in chapter 46 verses 9 and 10 so Elijah how long will you falter make up your mind how long will you limp along Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said in chapter 6 in verse 24 of Matthew 
no man can do what? No man can serve two masters. Why not? Because he'll love one and hate the other or cling to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or worldliness, selfishness. You can't serve two gods. If the Lord is God, follow him. Well, Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 41, take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 41. You've got verse 23 right there, but let's just read the entire statement there. Isaiah 41, starting at verse 21, Isaiah's challenge is, produce your cause, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and declare unto us what shall happen. Declare the former things what they are, that we may consider them, and know the latter end of them. Or show us the things to come. Declare the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods, yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Behold, now these are God's words through Isaiah concerning the false prophets and the idols that Israel has dedicated themselves to. Behold, you are of nothing, and your works, your work is of naught, an abomination is he that chooseth you. Show the things hereafter. All right, if, if, if you're a God, if you're a, a prophet of a real deity, show us what's going to happen in the future. Doesn't work that way. Flip a couple of pages to Isaiah chapter 46 and look at verses 9 and 10. And there, I am God, God says. And there is no other. How dare he be so arrogant as to claim he's the only God. There you go, Mike. It's not arrogance if it's fact. I'm the only God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like me. Go on in verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. The point in this is simply to say that the fulfillment of these forecasts, these prophecies. If you can pinpoint the prophecy and pinpoint its historical factual fulfillment, that's incontrovertible evidence. Think about the society around us, 21st century society. What are we seeing in the secular world what kind of attitude well okay on one hand there's there's a, an attitude of no limits anything goes no boundaries I'm going to do what I want to do uh, it, it's really kind of a time of the judges isn't it in those days there was no king in Israel and each man did that which was right in his own eyes except there is a king in Israel there's a ruler in the world and what are people doing <laughs> whatever's right in their own eyes and an attitude that says, how dare you, how dare you even consider to presume to tell me that there's a right and a wrong and I'm wrong. But you know what? God says, I'll tell you the end from the beginning. And that proves I am who I say I am. Well, the volume of fulfilled prophecies prevents any, it, it, it rules out the possibility of accidental fulfillment. Were there any other descendants of David 
who were born in Bethlehem of Judea? Any other male children of David's line born in Bethlehem? Very probably so. Some of them might even have been childhood playmates of Jesus. Were there any other descendants of David who were, well, just take your pick, born in the, the same time frame of Daniel's timeline, Daniel's 70 weeks as Jesus? Well, sure. <laughs> the, the tribe of Judah was hardly extinct. There are, here's the point, there are lots of individual details about Jesus that could be picked out and applied to other individuals. But there's only one person to whom they all apply and whom they all coalesce. Now, why is this important? Number one, Jesus says in John chapter 5 and verse 39, speaking to the rulers of the Jews, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life. And they testify of me. Now in the context of John chapter 5, what was Jesus actually saying to them? Take your Bible, flip over there, and let's just, just take a, a quick glance at, at the context of John chapter 5. <clears throat> In John chapter 5, you start at verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing of myself as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I seek not mine own will but the will of him that sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. It is another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent unto John, meaning John the prophet, John the baptizer, and he has borne witness unto the truth. But the witness which I receive is not from men, howbeit I say these things that you may be saved. He was the lamp that burns and shines. You were willing to rejoice for a season in his light, but the witness which I have is greater than John. For the works which the Father has given to me to accomplish the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So he's saying the things that were prophesied of me that I'm doing prove that I am who I say I am. And the Father that sent me has borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You have not his word abiding in you. You do not have his word abiding in you. For whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and these are they which bear witness of me and you will not come to me that you may have life. Now what Jesus says to them is you think because you possess the scriptures because you're the people to whom God gave the written law you think that is what gives you life and you're ignoring what they actually say there were there are abundant Old Testament prophecies that identify him Turn over to Luke chapter 24, the last chapter of Luke, and notice in verse 27, Jesus speaks to his disciples. This is after the resurrection. And in verse 27, beginning from Moses and from all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He started with Moses. Now, at that point in time, the expression all the scriptures refers to what? That's Genesis through Malachi. They didn't have the New Testament written down. But the warning that he gave to those Jewish leaders in John chapter 5 emphasizes the difference between possessing the scriptures and understanding them. We 
have to understand even the prophecies to get their benefit. Well, that's Jesus' own disciples in Luke 24. Let's look at some samples of Messianic prophecies, and then in the coming weeks we'll come back and look at some of these in more detail. Think about the broad categories of prophecies about Jesus. Now, if we go to Daniel chapter 9 and read Daniel chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, Daniel prophesies a lot of coming things. A lot of coming events. In that string of prophecies is the Messiah. But there are other things there as well, culminating in what? Daniel's prophecies really culminate in the end of Judaism and the beginning of Christianity. So there are other Old Testament prophecies that pertain to the New Testament era, but specifically talking about Jesus, oh, that's a lot smaller than I thought it would be. I hope you can read that. Coming of a Savior, and we've talked about this, Genesis 3. The fact that a Savior would come. Now, there are abundant Old Testament prophecies, a number of them that, that teach Israel, taught Israel, taught humanity, really, to look forward to a Messiah. And in order to find him, God gives identifying characteristics just a few examples. Facts of his birth. You look at Isaiah chapter 7. What's, what is the best known fact about the, the birth of Jesus? B born of a virgin. And we've talked about that in the past, how that that, that Hebrew word that's used in Isaiah 7 uh, has a range of meanings that could render it sort of generic. Young woman, a woman of marriageable age, a virgin, any of those things are, are possibilities if you just take the word by itself. But go back and look at the Septuagint translation of Isaiah chapter 7 that dates back to about 250 years before the birth of Jesus. How did the Jews of that era understand what Isaiah said? They used a word in Greek that means specifically a virgin, a woman who has never known a man, shall conceive and bear a child. Facts about his birth. That's not the only passage, by the way. How about the location of his birth? The Magi come to Herod. Where is he who is born king of Israel? <gasps> what? Soothsayers, prognosticators, counselors, advisors, come here. And where, where would we find him? Micah 5. Bethlehem of Judea. Well, that's convenient for Herod, isn't it? That's just a few miles away. How about the time of his birth? Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel interpreting the vision for Nebuchadnezzar of the image, golden head, silver breast, bronze belly, iron thighs, feet of iron mingled with clay. Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek, Roman eras. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will do what? Set up a kingdom that shall never, as the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews 12 and verse 28, never be shaken, an unshakable kingdom. It'll never be superseded, left to someone else. You know, the, the, the wording of Isaiah 2 is, is significant there. We, we miss this in that Nebuchadnezzar in his time was the ruler of the mightiest, most dominant empire in world history at that moment. How had Nebuchadnezzar come to power? 
here's where a little bit of history knowledge becomes a, a helpful thing. His father, Nabopolassar, if memory serves me, was his name, had been an Assyrian general in the Assyrian army, an Assyrian ruler. And consolidating power had effectively overthrown the Assyrian Empire. For about 80 years, the Babylonians would be the dominant power on earth. And then in the days of Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson actually, what would happen? Daniel's still alive, handwriting on the wall, weighed, weighed in the balances and found wanting. What happens? It's not exactly in the twinkling of an eye, but overnight, the Medo-Persians rise up and they don't destroy the Babylonian Empire. They just take Belshazzar out of the way and install their own rulership at the top. So the Babylonian, all they have to do is, is <laughs> really all they have to do is change the letterhead basically. And the Babylonian Empire becomes what? The Medo-Persian Empire. Slide on down another 150 or so years to the days of Philip of Macedon in, in northern Greece. And Philip begins to consolidate power among the, the scattered and, and warring tribes of northern Greece. Proposes to march south and then before he can do that, he dies and his boy, a teenager, Alexander, becomes king. And what does Alexander do? Alexander begins a campaign the likes of which the world has never seen and spreads as an apostle of Greek culture spreads the Greek empire across the known world. But when it comes to the Medo-Persians, what does he do with the Medo-Persian empire? Basically, they have some battles, they have some conflict, but basically he keeps large parts of it intact. It's left to another, just like the Babylonian empire had, just like the Assyrian empire had been. Alexander gets far from home over into western India and dies in a drunken stupor. And his four leading generals, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus, and the one whose name I can never remember, divide the empire amongst themselves and then begin to fight amongst themselves. And the Ptolemies and the Seleucids or Seleucids come out on top fighting each other. And poor Israel is caught in the big middle of all of this. And in the century before Jesus, two centuries before Jesus is born, the Jews are able to throw off the Greco-Seleucid yoke in the days of the Maccabees. And they have a little bit of freedom for about 40 years until the Romans come along. And what do the Romans do with the remnants of the Greek Empire? The Roman Republic adopts its language, adopts its religions, adopts its polity, its governmental style, adopts many of its customs, just grafts them onto Roman culture. Yet another empire left to another. And Daniel then says, in the days of those Roman kings, God will set up a kingdom that nobody else is ever going to inherit. In the time of his birth. Well, the purpose of his coming. Why did Jesus come? Okay, he says it in Matthew 18, verse 11, and Luke 19, and verse 10, to seek and to save that which was lost. But what did Isaiah say 750 years before that? 
by his stripes we would be healed by his sacrificial suffering we would be healed and by the knowledge of him we may be justified Isaiah 53 he would be preceded by an Elijah what did the people say about John the baptizer John the prophet he is a prophet they recognized him how camel's hair clothes and leather belt and living out in the wilderness eating rough preaching yeah locusts and wild honey preaching a blunt hammer between the eyes kind of message what had Isaiah said when Ahab confronted him? I'm not the problem, you are. Smack right between the eyes. That's how John preached. What does Jesus say of him? This is Elijah that goes before. What did John say about himself in John chapter 1? The, the rulers of the Jews came to him and said, Are you the one? And he said, No. The one who comes after me, I don't, I don't even deserve to untie his shoes. Now, when he says, I'm not the one you're looking for, but the one coming after me is, what does that say about him? He might as well have said, I'm not the one you're looking for. I'm the billboard that says, there he is. You see me, you know he's close behind. Drive down Interstate 75 through Jonesboro and at, uh, I believe it's exit 221, 220, you pass that exit that takes you off to, I guess that 221 would be what? Uh, Highway 41, I think, thereabouts. You pass that exit going south, and after about a mile, what do you see? Here's a great big green sign with white letters that tells you what? Next exit is in half a mile. And a half a mile later, what do you see? There's an exit lane. John's the billboard. So, think about the character of the Messiah. And I know our time is about up. What had Moses said 1,500 years before Jesus came along? God's going to send a prophet like me. How many prophets did God send? <laughs> Several, yeah, a lot. The interesting thing about that is in the 400 years from Malachi to John, you know how many prophets God sent? Zero in the intertestamental period. Goose egg. Malachi is the last until John. John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. But before Malachi... How often did God send prophets? You go from Moses to Malachi, not a century goes by, basically, that God does not send somebody. Especially from Jacob to Malachi. How many of the prophets in the Old Testament do we read about uh, who, whose lives come between Jacob and Malachi. Most of them. That means that from Jacob's time to Malachi's time, the people of Israel 
generally have a prophet or they can remember a prophet or they see one coming pretty much all the time. And then Malachi comes along, gives his message, and God turns it off just like Daniel said he would. And you've got four centuries of crickets as far as new revelation or anything of that sort. And historically, the people of Judah mourned. And they were very aware that there were no prophets. And they were looking for John. And they were looking for Jesus. Because their scriptures said, they're coming. And this is who you look for, somebody like Moses. Well, our time is up. We'll stop there. And we'll pick up and talk about messianic prophecy some more next week. Thank you for your participation, your comments, and your interest.